Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. Today, I'm here with art prof teaching artist Jordan McCracken Foster and Alex Rowe. Today, we are starting a new series called Art Rivals, and we're talking about some of the assumptions and negative perceptions that I think sometimes comes up between different areas and genres of visual art. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. This is more discussion. We're not really debating anything in the stream today. And I know we have a lot of streams here at Art Prof where we talk about how, oh, our parents don't understand us and people have all of these annoying stereotypes about artists. But you know what's really surprising is as much as I think as artists, we do group together and create these communities and support each other, sometimes that's not always the case. And so this is one of those rivalries that we've seen everywhere where traditional artists look at digital artists in a way that is somewhat negative and vice versa. So that is going to be the topic of the day. And we have a broad range because I am totally a traditional artist. Jordan, you're pretty much all digital at this point. Alex, you're sort of in between. So you're getting a pretty broad range of opinions. So let's start out by talking about digital art. Jordan, what type of reactions have you gotten to being a digital artist that maybe were not so positive? So I remember one time I did a painting of Spider-Man. For those of you who've seen our, enough of our streams, you know I'm a huge fan of Spider-Man. And I remember my mom wanting to share it with someone and she wanted to explain how I made it. And I said, oh, I use Photoshop for this. And she was under the impression, I guess, that there was like a make art button on Photoshop. And that for some reason, it's because I made it on the computer, made it way easier. And I didn't have to think about lighting and form and composition and all of this stuff. And she's like, oh, I don't want to tell them that because they're just going to assume that you didn't do anything. I was like, really? Like, come on, what in what universe does that really make sense? So I always get really frustrated when people think I'm not putting in that same work. Tell us in the chat if you're somebody who works digitally, whether you have gotten pushback from people, people who are judging you or thinking about you in a particular way that's negative. And we'll get to the traditional stuff later, but I'd love to hear from everybody about their experiences. Okay, another thing that I've actually heard a lot, which is so weird, is when people say digital art it's not real art. Have you heard that, Alex? Yeah, like I, before I kind of awakened to the idea that digital art is real art, I remember in my early undergrad hopping on that bandwagon and kind of, it was just extra dirt we'd throw on people in critiques of like, ah, this was digital and the printout looks bad and I wish you spent more time on that. And it's just kind of shady. Um, and it speaks to a lack of knowledge about the work that goes into digital art, which, yeah, it's, it's definitely a stereotype that a lot of traditional artists unfortunately have, I think. Yeah, we actually have a comment here from Electro Dash. They're saying, I've never seen digital artists disliking traditional artists. I've only see the other way around. Well, Jordan, do you see it as a mutual <laughs> rivalry or do you think it is somewhat uh more lopsided the way yeah. that they're saying yeah so when it comes to most digital arts first off most digital artists i don't think ever think of themselves as digital artists it's just a tool that they use just like a traditional artist may use a pencil or a brush or whatever it's just a tool to us and so the only real reason i've seen people talk or, or advise digital or traditional is cost uh, and maybe just the sizing of things. Like sometimes when you're working on a big painting, you don't want to store a big painting in your house. Maybe you don't have the room for it, but you can store a 22 inch Cintiq on your desk, you know? So those are usually the two biggest things. Um, and oil paint's kind of expensive. So, <laughs> so with that, I've never really seen that issue though. Well, I'm wondering, Alex, why do you think people have this perception that Photoshop is easy? Because this is our digital illustration tutorial. And if you guys watch it, oh my God, 
cat puts so much work. I mean, if you look at just the progress shots of her building this illustration, I cannot believe anybody would ever say this is more work. I mean, I actually feel as a traditional artist, I feel like in some ways digital work is more. It could be because I don't know a lot about it, but I cannot believe how much time people put into digital work. So Alex, why is that the case? Why do people think it's not a lot of work? I think it comes obviously from a lack of understanding about it where, yeah, anyone who has a small understanding of the work that goes into it knows how much it takes. But I think a lot of it is a misconception about how easy digital art makes it. This assumption that the ability to undo things and to go backwards and to save old files makes things so much easier when in reality, and like, I think Jordan made such a good point where it's not digital artist or traditional artist, it's just artist in making your pieces and learning, you learn and grow from them. And in a way, we all know it doesn't matter if you can save halfway through or not, you're still going to make the same mistakes. Right. We, we had this comment from John Murph Devera. Uh, it says, I would never complete art in digital art unless it's for film. I like paintings that are complete traditionally. And, you know, the reason I, I bring up this comment is because it just, it's, it's one of those things that's almost kind of subjective in a way like there are some people who just like to look at traditional paintings more versus digital and you know sometimes if you do it really well some artists do their job phenomenally where you can't even tell the difference um there's one artist in particular who i know who does all his painting digitally but he prints it on a canvas and so it still kind of has that feeling of you know mixing both media i don't know claire what do you think of something like that well, I mean, I think the thing is, I don't know why, but people seem to think the computer is different than a pair of scissors. And to me, they're tools. I mean, the thing about a pair of scissors is you have to learn how to use the scissors. You have to train yourself to get better at it. And a computer is the same way. I just don't know why people have this perception that the computer is in another universe. I mean, yes, it's a more complicated tool than a pair of scissors and it can do many more things, but I think you're right that ultimately you're an artist. You just happen to use different types of tools. But I think what I want to come back to is the physical result, because I definitely have heard traditional artists say, oh, well, a digital art, there's no true physical form because the only way to do that is to print it out. And that feels so cold and sterile. Have you seen that in art school, Alex? Because actually I am out of date because we didn't have digital art when I was in art school. So I never really talked about it with professors, but did that ever come up in class, Alex? Absolutely. And um, in my background, there was, I was in a lot of classes where it was easy to hop on the bandwagon and say, yeah, traditional art is better. Like, what are you doing doing digital art? And it was, it's really weird to look back in time and be like, oh, wh why did I say those things? <laughs> yeah, because there was such um, a negative vibe towards like printed out work sometimes. If like the printer didn't work, even sometimes the professor would say like, oh, well, that's your responsibility doing digital art. It's like, no, the printer broke. <laughs> like it's a lot of shade being cast. Um, yeah, Jordan, like what was, we were talking a little bit before about experiences with school and teaching digital or traditional. What are your thoughts on some of that? Yeah, well, well, first, I just want to read this comment real quick from Fausto. It says, my art teacher this year loves when I do digital art because she understands the work and effort we put into these pieces. It's the artist, not the tools. And I think that's kind of, that. that's the thing that I think a lot of teachers have a misunderstanding of. Some of my former professors primarily work traditionally and would sort of frown upon digital stuff and they would comment on some of those same points that Alex brought up earlier like oh the texture or oh the you know the colors being printed is off and it gets really frustrating because when you're working on something for so long and you put all your time and effort into it and for it to not be appreciated or to be seen as less than it can really make you struggle and I know a lot of artists who were like that in school who kind of put themselves into a little corner and they wouldn't really engage with a whole lot of students because of it. This is a really interesting comment from Moses. They're saying, I'm just really curious to know which one is best to learn first. I feel you can do a relative jump from traditional to digital. Well, Jordan, you've really had opposite extremes because your undergrad was all traditional. Your grad was 
all digital. So now that you have experience in both, that's pretty in depth. What would be your recommendation? Which one is better to start with? I think that traditional is the best place to start. Um, there's something so tactile just about the pencil and paper, you know, or brush and canvas, whatever you want to use. There's something about that that you cannot replicate with a digital tool. And as much as I value my Cintiq and iPad and all that stuff, I rely on those skills. And the other thing that I think mis that people misunderstand is that just because you're drawing digitally doesn't mean your drawing is going to come out better. Oftentimes it ends up exposing some of the flaws that you have um, in your in your drawing repertoire, if you will. And so I all I still draw traditionally as much as I can, but I use that information to allow my digital work to really flourish. And Alex, I know you're sort of a hybrid between <laughs> me and Jordan in that you're mostly a traditional painter, but you do actually incorporate digital processes into your work. And there are a lot of people that do that. Like this character design tutorial that Kat did, she actually starts out just sketching with a pencil for a really long time before mm -hmm. she actually goes into the digital media. And so there is this argument for using them together in the same artwork. Why do you think that might be helpful? I think it's, to me, it helps me change and grow as an artist during the pieces where so often the learning comes after the piece and you see all your mistakes. But utilizing the tool of digitally, even though I am mostly a traditional artist, I'm not saying like throw away your brushes and just get a Cintiq. It's a good tool to have to help supplement your learning and your creation. And it's funny bringing up Kat's examples because I'm the exact opposite where I do a lot of my sketches and color studies digitally, mostly because I don't want to spend the time stretching canvas or buying a sketchbook to do color studies. <laughs> so I'll do all of those digitally and that can give me a much quicker, easier look at the color palettes I want to be using. Jordan, do you think that's common now for people to do both in a single artwork or do you think it's still pretty much an only digital artwork or an only traditional artwork? I think there's more of a hybrid than most people really think. Um, I've seen a lot of artists who will post their digital work just as much as their traditional work. And there's just some, there's just something about paper that you can't really replace. Uh, for me, there are times where sometimes I would feel kind of stuck or trapped because I was working digitally. And oftentimes you get distracted because when you work in digitally, some, you often have access to like YouTube and stuff like that, and or reading an article or a book, and you have all this fancy stuff. And sometimes I get distracted, and there are times where I just like, you know, let me just pull out my old clipboard and just start drawing. And that actually helped me design a couple of my characters for my project, and that just helped me loosen up. Um, I also want to bring this up. Alyssa says, I began as a traditional artist, and the tradition to digital wasn't easy. There's a learning curve. You have to think as a, a whole new direction. And then Ra Nuck says, I tried digital art, got thoroughly confused with all those layers and settings and stuff. I'm not going to try that for some time for sure. Um, that's the other thing that makes it tricky is learning digital. There is a curve to it. It can be challenging just to even get your lines to look right. So everything. Well, I think with digital, one of the hesitations I've had about starting it, other than the fact that my daughter pretty much lives with our iPad Pro and never lets me touch it, is that I think it is intimidating. I mean, just look at the screenshot of Photoshop. Your average person looks at this and goes, oh my God, there are 18 crop tools. There's 86 layers. Like, what do I do with this? I mean, I think from that point of view, I can understand why somebody might say, you know what, just give me a pencil. Like That's all I really want. And I do think that's one of the reasons why a lot of traditional artists maybe just don't even want to go there because it's just so overwhelming. So Alex, you paint traditionally. Mm -hmm. What was the most compelling, attractive thing about digital that made you say, you know what, this is worth it? I think when I first started to enter into digital and when I tried making full digital pieces, I was drawn to the cleanness of the color that you could have. The very clean graphic look really drew me into it because I was not yet a skilled enough watercolor painter to have unmuddy colors. So I was like, I'm tired of everything being different shades of brown. Let's enter into something where I can be really crisp and clean with the color. 
And that was really helpful going into it. And in that way, it taught me a little bit about traditional painting. It's almost like um, there's a comment I just saw by uh, Jenny, the first edition, where she says that she became a traditional artist, but slowly transitioned to digital art. And it's hard though, it feels like two different things. And that's exactly what I thought. Um, hearing people tell me that there's so many tools to make digital art look like watercolor or look like gouache, I was expecting it to be very easily translatable. And it was not. It was as different as working with pencil and then working in watercolor. So yeah, Jordan, what do you, what was that transition like from you when you kind of first entered into the digital realm? Well, it started off uh, with like Microsoft Paint, which is like a really old. Yeah. Not very good. We were, I, I didn't even have a mouse and I tried to make art just using a trackpad. So I would literally just be doing this for like hours, you know, and it was so awful. Um, when I finally got uh, a Cintiq though, when I finally used a Cintiq, it felt like a whole new world. And I kind of understood how Photoshop worked, but it, it was it was challenging because there were so many things I wanted to do and I knew I had access to all this stuff, but I was just not able to produce it. And I think it just has more to do with my skill level at the time. But I know that that can be um, discouraging for a lot of people too, when they see all this amazing work on ArtStation or on Instagram, and then they look at their work and they're like, oh, but I can't. And so that challenge definitely hit me as well. Well, I think another thing to bring up too is that digital media has not been around for a very long time. I mean, we didn't do it when I was in art school. It did not exist. And digital art is so prominent now at so many schools. And a lot of students, I think, do feel like, oh no, if I don't gain digital art skills, nobody will hire me. And so I think there is an association with certain industries that if you don't do digital, you're not gonna get a gig. And so there is that part of it. But, you know, I sort of wonder what if 10,000 years from now, I mean, I don't know if we're going to be around <laughs> as the human race 10,000 years from now, but let's pretend digital art has been around for centuries. Are people going to not have as much pushback? Because I think a big reason traditional artists sometimes are not as quick to accept it, it's just new. And I think a lot of people, when there's something new, it's really easy to have a very aggressive, no, 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 we can't do this type of thing. So Alex, do you think that's part of it? Oh yeah, like when I think of not all, but a lot of professors that I had all worked, learned and eventually came to retire in traditional art. So digital was a kind of new kid who, not to say anyone intentionally disrespected it, but just kind of poo-pooed it as like, oh, this is, you don't need this. It's just a thing, um, which yeah, could not be further from the truth. I want to share this comment from Alyssa. It says, people forget that digital art can be more than cartoons. It can be equally complex in detail as an oil painting. And that's so true. That's like, it's sort of like saying, just because you use a pencil, uh, it doesn't mean you can't create all these amazing things like Da Vinci or Michelangelo or something. But I can also use it to draw SpongeBob if I felt like it. And it's kind of like what we were saying earlier, it's just the tool. And I think all those 10,000 years from now, like Claire was <laughs> saying, that it's it, we're gonna look at it the same way as people look at oil painting today or, you know, or whatever other media, it's just another tool to use. And it can be very helpful for a lot of people who may not have access to other things for whatever reason. And the generational gap really is problematic because you know something, a lot of the professors who are teaching college right now, some of them are 60. And I mean, think about how they think about digital art. I mean, I did not grow up with it and they didn't grow up with it. And a lot of them have no interest and they're getting students like you, Jordan, really wanted to learn digital art as an undergrad and people just couldn't give it to you because they didn't have that. And so again, maybe in 50 years, that's not gonna be the case, but I think that's part of it too. It's also a generation gap that a lot of people really have trouble with. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at how sometimes digital artists will see traditional art as not being relevant anymore. Alex, why do you think you would say that? Why would you say stretching a canvas, oil painting, that's over? <laughs> have you heard that argument? I have. I've made that argument myself, usually when I'm the third corner of stretching a canvas. 
that it's this is dumb. I'm this is I'm over with this. Um, and it's fair. I think that my whole thought on it is that I wish there was a unified thought rather than an either or. Um, that yeah, neither medium is going anywhere. Both have their uses. It's just like using a different tool for a different purpose. But I can absolutely understand kind of looking at the wind and seeing like, oh man, is traditional art even going to be around any much longer? But no, I think that there's always going to be places and spaces for it. Let's take a look at this question from Moses. How do you exhibit digital art? Any thoughts? Jordan, you're the one to answer this question. Um, well, I think you could print it in a book. I mean, you can print it and put it up in a gallery showing just as easily. When I had my senior show at, at RISD, I would say 50 to 60% of the work in the entire show, me and my classmates, was digital. And we just printed it, made, checked the colors, we put it on nice paper and just put it up on the wall. And sometimes people don't even know the difference because the tool that they use maybe looked like watercolor and, you know, and no one had a problem with it. A pretty image is a pretty image regardless of the tool you use because there are plenty of paintings out there that are not very pretty, <laughs> you know? And um, it, again, the tool, the software that you use does not indicate how high quality a piece is. So you could print it, put in a movie, put in a book, whatever. Mm -hmm. I will say though, if you do get physical prints made of digital images, there's such a range of what you can get and you definitely get what you pay for. Because I'm not a digital artist, but a couple of years ago, I had these sculptures and I really saw the final result as being photos of the sculptures. And so the first time in my life, I had to actually have prints made at a photo lab. Oh my God, they cost an arm and a leg because I opted for the really high quality paper and they look great. I mean, I was not complaining about the result, but it's expensive to get stuff printed. And you can get it printed cheap, but it looks bad. Like Jordan, have you seen badly printed digital art? I think we all have. <laughs> I've seen a lot of, uh, I've seen a wide range of things in digital and in traditional. It, you know, it, you definitely get what you pay for. You have to make sure if you if you want your work to look good, you got to put in the time, the effort, the finances, and all the other stuff. Alex, I'm wondering, what about this argument that digital artists sometimes make that traditional art is too much work? I mean, if you guys watch this tutorial, I mean, Alex and I stretch uh, canvases and oh my God, it is not fast. <laughs> it takes a long time and sometimes you have to wait a day or a week to get back to it. Like who's got that kind of patience? So what do you say to that argument, Alex? Oh, it's not worth it, it's too much work. It's it's so funny, first off, because it's the exact counter argument to the traditional artists that don't know digital that say like, ah, oh, that's that's no work at all. Why are they doing that? <laughs> um, it, it really just depends on, I think, why you're drawn to the mediums you're drawn to, uh, including digital in that realm. Uh, like for me, it was after kind of dipping my toe into digital and kind of realizing, like, oh, no, I really feel these extra steps of traditional media with no disparagement towards digital. Um, I, I think a lot about the world of children's book publishing, where if you pick a children's book off the shelf and you look at it, the texture included within digital media is so often at the forefront of children's books and collage work is so often apparent. And so I think that that tactile freedom is something that really draws me to it. Whereas digital, you have, of course, even more freedom potentially but I'm just drawn to that idea of being able to put literally everything in the kitchen sink into a painting. Yeah, and interesting to talk about the generational differences. Jordan, what do you say to a younger kid, say who's in middle school and really has grown up on digital art? Because I watched the way my daughter has grown up with it. She really doesn't want to do traditional work. She's on Procreate all day and she works really hard. And once in a while, I'm like, hey, you want to get this pencil and draw, like I try to slowly not try, she's no interest. And so Jordan, how do you maybe convince a mostly digital artist? You know what, you, you should maybe try some of these processes. Yeah, well, you know, there are gonna be times where there are power outages or when the battery dies and, <laughs> or you, 
pencil or a new nib for your, your Cintiq pen or something like that. And does that suddenly mean you just can't work anymore? Like, I can't produce art. I'm stuck. I'm lost. You know, I think that would be a poor excuse. And so I think a, tr a real art, someone who's really serious about their craft will find whatever tools they need. Uh, if I had a broken pencil and I wanted to draw, I would go and buy some chalk or something like that, or, you know, find some dirt on the ground and just start doodling in, in the dirt. I think it's just something that's innate. And I don't think, uh, I don't think someone should restrict or, or restrict themselves from doing traditional at all. We have this question from Blue Wolf Spirit. What's the best digital tool to get started in digital art? Now, you think you'd ask Jordan, our resident digital expert, but I'm gonna ask Alex this because you do have less experience. What would you recommend? I was so blown away the first time like I borrowed a friend's iPad and used Procreate. It was the most user friendly. Um, like Clara, you mentioned this about Photoshop before where there's like a million and one different tabs and buttons to do and it's very intimidating. Um, and I think and also with the decision for it to now be a monthly fee for Photoshop, um, I think the cost to procreate and the accessibility is just awesome. And it's the kind of thing I wish that I had five or 10 years ago, because then I would be all about it. Um, but I think I, kind of like with Jordan remembering Microsoft Paint, I'm remembering the first foray into digital art I had was making short animations on Microsoft PowerPoint back in the 90s. <laughs> so I would say amending that to say whatever digital tool you feel comfortable with <laughs> is the best digital tool for you to not be afraid of this new medium for you. I'll tell you the first time I ever really truly had an impulse to want to try digital art was when I saw the Apple Pencil. Because when I watched Kat do the digital illustration tutorial, she uses Photoshop and a tablet. And I just could never wrap my head around using a tablet and having to look at the screen, but also do something else with my hand. And the way that the Apple Pencil just, it's like a pencil. That makes sense to me. And I feel like that I could really do, but the tablet in the Photoshop, like I find that really, really hard to understand. We have this question from Satan takes me to the pasta. How is digital art seen in the fine art world? I've seen it more prominently in the entertainment industry, but not in galleries and stuff. It's not that you don't see it, it's just that you see it in a different form. What I typically see is that digital art in the fine arts world, it's usually some installation art where they're projecting images onto a building. I'm thinking about somebody like Jenny Holzer, or maybe it's this concept of a computer file that you engage with <laughs> as a 21st century human, and that's a conceptual piece. And so it's not that it doesn't exist, it's just that I don't think people are into printouts, again, because the physical object in the fine arts world, I do think is a little bit more important there in a way that it's not, I think, in a, say, concept art industry. I don't think people care so much because, I don't know, like Jordan, for concept art, do people really buy that stuff? I suppose you could if the show gets popular, but do people buy it? Um, they'll buy art books, they buy stuff like that, but that's that usually is up to the artist as an individual. But when you're working at a company, they will usually put out something for the company that they'll take all the art from their staff and stuff and say, this is our product. And there are some artists who individually like to do more traditional fine art stuff. Uh, like Nathan Fox is a good example. He put out a whole uh, book on charcoal drawing and portraits and all completely traditional, but he is known for doing a lot of digital artwork and working for DreamWorks and doing backgrounds for them. So yeah, it just varies. It's a very different mindset because actually when I started studying illustration as an undergrad, I was a total fine art painter. I had no clue how illustration worked. And in illustration, what they really try to push on people is that the final product of an illustration is not the painting. It's actually the image in the magazine. That is the final result. Like, have you heard that? I'm sure you've heard that, Alex. <laughs> oh yeah. And it, it makes me think of the kind of, let's call it new emerging, like younger art world out there where for me, the art world that I'm in touch with and that friends of mine are actively in is the one of first Friday art shows and galleries and even having booths at Comic-Con. 
and selling prints. And it makes me think that a lot of advice for aspiring digital artists in that realm is to, we hinted at this before, but to talk to photographers about good prints, getting good papers that doesn't break your budget where you don't make a profit off the events. But yeah, I think of some artists in uh, last art show I went to was back in Denver and they had their digital work framed up on the wall and then really high quality prints of every piece that was for sale. And that's so much more attainable for the viewers at a gallery rather than dropping a couple hundred dollars on a piece. We have a question from Megan B. If you want to test out some expensive software without paying for it and you're not enrolled in art school, is that possible? Jordan, I think you probably have an answer for this. Yeah, well, a lot of these companies like Adobe will allow you to do a free trial for a month and you can try it out there. But there's a lot of tools that are very, very cheap anyway and that can still do a lot. Like Procreate is a one-time buy. At the most, it's $15. It might even be like 10 or something like that and you keep it for life. Uh, mm -hmm. Adobe's been under hot water because they recently did have a subscription model and you have to pay like 50 to to $100 a month to use their program. It's sort of like a Netflix and it's just... A lot of people get irritated by that. So there, there's always a resource out there and you just have to do your research and find them. We have another comment from Nina Marie. In digital art, I find it so difficult to imagine the final result reaching my final goal for the piece. Traditional, I feel like I'm better able to imagine my goal. Anybody else experience this? What do you think, Alex? Mm -hmm. It does hit to something where, and I think one of the things why I, at the end of the day, focus mostly on traditional um, because I think I let traditional surprise me a little bit, but actively like, I really don't know what's going to happen when I put the watercolor in this much water on the paper. Let's see where it goes. Um, so I think I kind of have the reverse problem as Nina does. Um, but I think that, yeah, that might be just speaking to which medium you find more comfort in. And there is no wrong answer. This, I mean, I, if it's helpful for people to think of it, imagine if we were talking about the difference between pastel and colored pencil. It's really, at the end of the day, it's about your personal preference too, as an artist. Right, I mean, for me, I tried digital art. I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen, help me. Like, My daughter was making fun of me actually, because sometimes she wants me to try procreate just to laugh at how i use it and she was like why aren't you making layers why are you drawing everything on the same layer like this was like sacrilegious to her and i was like i don't work in terms of layers that's not something i can wrap my head around yeah <laughs> we have a comment from slept near one two three it says there is a truth of letting things happen see what happens and that is one of the benefits of traditional because when i'm working digitally oftentimes why I struggle with and a lot of other artists, they tend to just zoom in all the way and get fixated on this uh, one little dot that's really like maybe a quarter, you know, a quarter <laughs> inch worth of space and they spend all this time and when you zoom out, it doesn't really make much of a difference. And so there's that really, there's that trap that I've seen. And sometimes a lot, uh, a lot of artists will have trouble seeing the big picture. So that's one of the benefits of traditional for sure. John Murphy saying, would you say that a print costs more than a traditional art painting? Pretty much never. I would say the difference is that a traditional art painting is a unique object and you cannot replicate it. Whereas if you have a print, once you have the digital file, you can print it as many times as you want. I mean, what some artists will do is they'll print something called an edition. So you'll say, okay, I made this digital image. I'm going to print it in an edition of 50 prints and then never print it again. And that's a way for people to make the individual prints just a little bit more valuable. Because if you don't print an edition, it's even worth even less <laughs> because people are like, oh, I know they're just gonna keep printing out as many as they want and a thousand people could own it. That makes it much less valuable. So the concept that one person owns that one painting, that alone, regardless of who is the artist, makes a difference in terms of pricing. Another question here, we can't get the same feeling from Ramuk of being able to touch and feel the piece with digital, can we? I emotionally connect with that feeling of touching and feeling a piece. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, th there is something about actually touching the paper and seeing like, like a physical book. Like I have an art book collection, I adore it. And I have PDFs of the same books, but the only reason I have those 
is because I just don't want to destroy the books from holding it too much because that has happened to me several times. Um, and so when I'm working digitally, there are times where I'm like, man, I wish I could really hold it. But at that point, it just becomes a personal preference and just what you need to get the job done. And it's some, it's one of those small aspects of the job that I try not to harp on too, too much. But for, you know, I would like to get a print one day of my stuff and put it in a book and just have it be real fancy and show it off. I would definitely love that for sure. Here's another comment from Fausto Mendoza. I feel like traditional art can be a bit more organic than digital because you can't fix the quote mistakes you made. That's why I love doing digital. Well, that's a huge difference between traditional and digital. If I paint something and I paint over it, I can't undo. That's a big difference for people. So Alex, what's your take on that? I think that it's just the same problem, different decade or century. Um, like the first traditional artist to think of is William Blake, who just used some of his pieces. It's just mixed media because it's everything he could find. And there have been pieces that I've worked on traditionally where I really mess up. And those have been the ones where I've discovered how to use acrylic painting on top of watercolor well. Um, so I think it's just a different way to learn from those mistakes. But I do think it points out a benefit of digital is that you can learn more actively and quickly as you're making it. Like there's no gold star you get being a traditional artist with no undo button. Um, it is objectively a better way to learn to be able to go backwards and correct your mistakes. I'm gonna play devil's advocate with you, Alex, because I'm <laughs> gonna argue that sometimes not being able to go back and fix it can be a great learning experience actually. Because Jordan, I don't know if you remember, but when you were in my class, the first art material I make students draw with is crayon. Mm. And crayon, you can't erase it. Yeah. And it drives the freshmen up the wall. They hate it for so long because you have to deal with your marks. Do you remember that, Jordan? Yes, very much so. I got no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you think that might actually be good experience to have as frustrating and as hard as it could be as an artist? Well, I think it's great to start start working in a way where you can just leave things as they are because it forces your mind to to fix those mistakes and learn from it faster and it's sort of like oh i'm not going to do that again uh, i know that line's off and when you have to commit to something like that you tend to just live with it and let it go uh, i found myself even working digitally i'm always on the control z or command z for those who don't know that's the undo button and there are some artists who literally have their one hand on the screen drawing and the other hand on control z like the entire time they won't move it and that can be a crutch sometimes especially if you're really trying to grow as an artist now if you have a deadline do what you got to do but <laughs> for learning i think it can be challenging for sure Guys, Art Prof has a podcast. It is available on Spotify and also on iTunes. If you are listening, leave us a rating and a review. Please join us on Discord. The invite link is in the video description below. Alex, Jordan, and I will be over there in about five minutes in the post live streams channel. There were so many cool comments that we did not get to during the stream. So we're happy to chat with you guys about this and subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make all this possible. Thank you to everybody for contributing to the live stream. It's such a great conversation when we have so many different opinions going on. Everybody, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.